Last week I was watching a movie and in the movie there was a war scene and I saw this right in the middle of the movie. I, this guy yelled out to his team and said, hey, situational awareness, you know, pay attention, look up, look forward, look down, look around. And then I missed the next 45 minutes of the movie because I couldn't get that term situational awareness out of my spirit. And sometimes, I mean, the Lord would just talk to me like that. Like, well, but was it a Christian movie? Well, it became one then. <laughs> it sure did. Because for, uh, for a long time, I just thought about, Lord, do I have situational awareness? Is the, I know, God, that you've given me weapons of warfare that are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. But, but do I have the wisdom and the discernment to know how to use the weapons that you've handed me in the new battlefields that I'm on? When I was a, a young man growing up in Jesus, um, I, I would just read anything and everything. And I asked somebody, what is the greatest book on spiritual warfare that you've ever read? And in the late 80s and early 90s, you know, spiritual warfare was like every book that came out was about spiritual warfare, right? And people were learning how to fight spiritual warfare. And that was a big theme of that time frame. And I asked somebody, hey, man, what is, what's the greatest book on spiritual warfare you've, you've ever read? And he said, well, it's a book called The Art of War. And I went, oh, well, I'll have to look it up. And he said, well, you won't find it at a Christian bookstore. He said, it was written thousands of years ago by this Chinese dude. And you guys know what I'm talking about, right? And a lot of people have actually um, looked at that book on how to do business. They've looked at it for business strategies. And it's actually applicable in so many different parts of life. But I want to tell you truly, whether that man knew it or not, um, it's a book on principles of spiritual warfare. Because warfare is warfare right? And one of the things that he says is this, here's how you know if you're going to lose a war. If you fight in the field the same way you fight in the mountain, you will lose. The field requires a completely different set of tactics and rules and objectives and actually values will actually change from a mountain kind of warfare to a valley kind of warfare. And I can remember when I was first reading that and looking at that, it made a tremendous impact on me. And then this last week when I heard the term situational awareness and how that that is so important with any kind of moment of intense warfare. I got to thinking about that and I got to thinking about the importance that the Lord has been speaking to the entire body of Christ since really at the beginning of 2020 that we have to change our wineskins. It's a new era and the old things are not going to work in this new place. And God Almighty is going to pour out his spirit. But if he pours out his spirit into a frame that is an old wineskin, the wineskin or the frame will bust and the wine will be poured out and it will never be used for what it was intended to be used for. And I've been thinking about that just as, as a church leader and as somebody who leads in the body of Jesus and somebody who speaks in the cameras and tells people, and I'm constantly thinking about that. Hey, I don't want to miss the new thing because I'm fighting for a thing that no longer matters. And I'm like, okay, whoa, are there things that they matter for a time? Yeah, there are things that if you don't do that thing at that time, everything fails. But then God Almighty will begin to highlight something else. And I'm not talking about the character of God changing or the word of God changing. I'm talking about the effectiveness of warfare now. That's what I'm talking about. And that a lot of us will insist to be on a battlefield that the Lord is not fighting on anymore. He's moved to a whole other terrain and said, now, you know what, we're going to be looking into these places now. And he's looking and saying, look at this harvest, but hardly anybody shows up. The harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. Whenever Isaiah says concerning prophetic things, he says, behold, I do a new thing, shall you not know it? The issue with a new thing and the problem with a new thing is that you can completely miss it because you're not looking for that thing. You're looking for another thing. And you can actually miss the new thing. And I'm talking about incredible things in Jesus, like ridiculous things in Jesus. Like what? Like what are you talking about? I'm talking about what if God Almighty put himself in the form of flesh became a human being and entered into humanity, entered into time and space and went, boom, I am here. I've been promising that I would show up for 4,000 years. I'm here. And everybody in Bethlehem missed it. That actually happened. 
it's so easy to miss some of the most amazing things that's ever happened because you didn't know how to look for it. You know what's funny? Is many times ungodly people are better at looking than godly people. Wise men show up from the east. Dudes who study the stars. Babylonians who worship the zodiac show up to give homage because they know how to look. They know when to look because somebody invaded their kingdom 400 years earlier by the name of Daniel, who was in charge of all the wise men of Babylon and taught them how to look for the king. But that's another story. So I heard this term supernatural situational awareness, discernment for the day and the place that we live in. You know, as we travel through life, something can happen and we've seen it happen, if not in ourselves, and we've certainly seen it happen in other people's lives, where something will happen and it's so traumatic and it's so bad and it's such a big deal that those people are just never the same after that. The death of someone that they love with all their heart or they worked super hard to get a house and then they lost their home or something. Something terrible. Something traumatic. Something that happens that never should have happened. And then their life never looks the same after that. All of us in here have some form of that, hopefully a smaller form than a larger form of that, but it's part of humanity that we suffer those things. Well, those demonic places, places that say, you're never allowed to walk in victory here. You're never, ever, ever to have the promises of God after this. You're never allowed to occupy this in the kingdom. In the Old Testament, those places are personified in something called giants. The giants are a demonic human hybrid of what happens when the devil gets a hold of your humanity and produces something and teams up with your enemy called the Philistines. And they are bigger and meaner and more horrible and something you have nightmares about, something you hope you never come across. And then a day comes, you come across that and you say, my God, I, I didn't ever want to see this day happen. And that devil shows up and says, the day is here right now and you're never going to walk in the promises of God, ever. Giants have to be slain. Giants have to be confronted. Giants have to be spoken to. Giants have to be dealt with. You, you can't get along with the giant, and you cannot walk in the promises by trying to avoid the giants. You do not get the blessings of God by how skillfully you avoid giants. And that's why we have to, that's why the Lord is requiring the entire body of Jesus in this day to change from what if, what if, what if, to even if I'm going to do it. Even if I'm still going to do it. Even if I'm going to walk this. Even if. That's a completely different mentality. The Bible says that when King David showed up and whenever he spoke to the giant, in 1 Samuel 17, it says, and David said to the Philistine, well, you come to me with the sword and with the spear and with the javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. He's like, it's immaterial that you defied me, but you defied God, and I'm here in his name, so you're about to go. That whole mentality is so, you know, all of David's brothers and the rest of Israel had a mentality of, let's just hide and hope he goes away. And after 40 days... They're still hiding and hoping he would go away. And you're like, well, that's absolutely ridiculous. You've done that. I've done that. I've had scary things in my life where I go, I just, I just try and block that out and just try and not think about it and just hope it goes away. No, 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 no. Listen, the day comes when you have to confront that thing. And you have to show back up. I just felt, I felt a hand just stand on my shoulder. <laughs> I, I'm sorry for my weirdness. I probably shouldn't have shared that with you. Love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. But there comes a time, man, where you, have to, where you have to show up and say, hey, I'm here. Remember me? And when that monster gets up and say, you know what? It's really not about how you stood against me, but it's about how you stood against God. And I'm here in his name. And I'm showing up for the fight. And then he goes on to say in verse 46, this day. The Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and I'm going to take your head clean off. To show up and tell the devil, 
I got a new spot on my wall for your head. <laughs> I've moved stuff around. I've rearranged my whole living room. And I'm going to put your nasty head right above my TV. That, that's a crazy thing to me. And, and I want to just tell you, I love that. To say, listen, here's the deal. I'm not, not only am I not trying to avoid this, not only do I not want to thank it, once I take your head, I'm going to look at this trophy every single day for the rest of my life. Whoa. Mm. I'm thinking about the pirate red beard right now. Like, why? Because the guy who confronted him, who wasn't afraid of him, who needed to show up, who needed to go after him, he was paid by a bunch of merchants, and he told him, said, I will go out there, and I'll go to war against that guy, but I want a piece of everybody's business here on the East Coast, and I'm going to be rich when I come back. They're like, well, how will we know that you actually killed him? And he said, because I'll, I'll make a beer mug out of his skull, and I'll leave his beard on it. And when he came back into town, guess what he was drinking out of? Imagine what the negotiation room was like when he went in there and slammed that drink down on the table and said, so let's talk about our contracts. Mm, I'm sorry, but I love that. The thing that can't be confronted, the thing that, ever, the thing that has always terrorized you, the thing that's always said no, the thing that's always threatened you, and just go, let's go find him. And let's make a trophy out of his head. That's a completely different mentality and I love King David for it. And then he says, And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and with spear, for the battle belongs to the Lord, and he will give you into my hands. He's like, God's already decided I'm winning, and I've decided I'm going to participate. That's what I'm doing. And that's what happened. Guys, I want to tell you that your giants have to be con confronted. You have to have true situational awareness whenever you have a battlefield that there's something massive, it stinks, it's demonic, it's abominable, it, it's horrible. What it says makes you cringe. How it looks makes you cringe. How it smells makes you cringe. The whole thing is just like, oh my gosh. And what you want to do is just skillfully avoid it. And there comes a day where God will say, why don't you rise up and speak to that thing, go to war with it. See, I've determined you're going to win. You just got to determine you're going to fight this thing. <laughs> Amen. In the New Testament, what is referred to as a giant in the Old Testament is referred to as a mountain in the New Testament. And mountains also have to be spoken to. And mountains, just like giants, must be removed. They got to be removed. They got to be dealt with. You know, in the same way, a person can have a situation in their life where they're just like, okay, I got to, I got to this point, and man, I was trucking good, and things, things were really good. And then this thing happened, and I'm never going to get past it. That's a mountain. I'm never going to get over it. That's a mountain. I don't have the skill to even approach it. That's a mountain. If I go there in that place, it'll kill me. It nearly kills me every single time. That's a mountain. And on your journey, you're going to come across mountains, and you have to literally stand in faith and speak to your mountain and say, get out of my life. You will not prohibit me any longer. Listen, this is not according to my flesh. This is according to the spirit of the living God. And here's what's real. God has determined I'm going to win. So I am determined I'm going to participate in this. Out. Out. Just go to hell. Just go directly to hell. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Go directly to hell. That's what hell was made for. Adios. And keep speaking to that thing and say, no, 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 no. You don't speak to me. I speak to you. You put yourself in the middle of my path. You're out. I'm not gonna get. I'm not gonna get over you. I'm not gonna get past you. You're gonna get out of my life. That's what's gonna happen. Faith removes mountain, friends. It's faith. What God has told you, and believing in the character of the Lord, and go. Well, I, 
I can't really stand much for me, but I can sure stand for the character of the Lord. And he's a whole lot better than me. He's a whole lot better than me. And if I stand here and if I speak this word, he's going to activate. He's going to make this thing real. He's just wanting me to get involved. Okay, well, that's fine. But what if you get killed? No, not what if, even if I get killed. This is the life that I'm, I'm bound and determined that I'm going to live. Not what if, but even if. Dad it, even if. I mean, come on. Is there, are there any real men left on the planet Earth anymore? Are there any real women left on the planet Earth anymore? Are there any families who will stand? Where are the people of God? Woo, we're scared. We might get in trouble. That can't be you. It can't be you. Like, oh, well, what are you going to do if this happens? If that, no, again, what the world wants you to have is a what if commercial. And just relive, don't you hate commercials? Which, by the way, every commercial that is on TV today has a homosexual agenda to it. Why is that? What are you selling? What are you peddling? Why, why, why are you having to sell that? Why is that? Oh, I, I, commercials just make me mad. I, I'm, every dadgum commercial in the world that I see now, I'm just like, why do I have to say that? All right, well, just exactly like that. If you can, why? Because if you can frame a certain narrative into a market, it's an agenda of a narrative into a market, and you're the one that they're selling it to. Man, they think you're stupid. They think you don't have the ability to know right and wrong. If a man's a man, if a woman's a woman, that's how stupid you are. But that's okay. They'll be happy to tell you those things, and they want you to buy. That's the day that you and I live in today. Where good is called evil and evil is called good. You better not buy. No, oh, Pastor Troy, you can't, you can't get up and talk like that. I can talk any way I want to talk. I sure can. It's like, you're not going to tell me how to talk. Oh, Pastor Troy, we sure hope that whenever the cameras get on and you have television all over the world, that you, we sure hope that you don't back off. So you didn't know me when you said those things to me. Just because you would do that in that situation doesn't mean I will do that in that situation. I never had one single person come to me and tell me that, that I didn't suspect the same thing of them. I know what's going to happen. You're going to get up there and that church going to get all big and you're just going to start dumbing everything back. And I was like, you know, this is not you running the show, pal. By the grace of God. Amen. So... In exactly the same way, though, that a person can have a personal touch of something, some disaster happened to them, and then they never get over it. They never get past it. They don't know how to deal with that giant. They don't know how to deal with that mountain. In the same exact way, a person can have one encounter with God, and they're never the same after that. They can, they can hear God speak one word, and they are not the same anymore. They're just not the same anymore. They can, they can literally hear God. They go, whoa, whoa, whoa. This changes everything. And then people be like, whoa, what happened to you? I remember, guys, when I first got saved, I'm not making this up. People would call me. Hi, man. I heard that you went and got the religion. Well, <laughs> no. I, I, and I didn't have, I didn't know how to explain it. I, they're, they're like, what happened? I'm like, man, I don't know. Jesus just showed up and. He showed up and told me he loved me. And I didn't have any Christian friends. And I didn't, I didn't know the word of God yet. And I didn't know what to say. And people are like, so what happened? I'm like, man, I don't know. I'm sitting there minding my own daggum business. And this fire got on me. And I was just like, man, that's Jesus and he loves me. Oh, no, I'm about to become a Jesus freak. I can see it already. I know what's about to happen. And they're like, why? I'm like, I don't know. And I had no theology yet. I had no uh, Bible verses. I didn't have an amen corner. And they would say, they'd say, well, everybody says you look different. And I'd say, well, come over and gawk at me. And they would. <laughs> People would come over, stand up. And I'd stand up. They'd be like, dang. I, I looked different when I got saved. I just looked different. I had a touch from the Lord. I, I showed up and Jesus showed up in my life and he told me he, he, told me he loved me. And like, man, and I was like, whoa, I think Jesus loves me. And that's amazing. Hallelujah. And I'm like, okay, wow. And I was just not the same after that. See, that same exact thing that makes you vulnerable to your life being altered by something bad 
that same exact thing also makes you a candidate for your life being altered by the presence of the Lord. I had a, a good friend of mine that was an old man when I was young, and he had a radio, he had a radio program, and uh, <laughs> he was just a real old guy, and he was so sweet, and uh, I was fascinated with radio growing up, and I wanted to be on radio, and I wanted to have a radio ministry as soon as we got saved. It took me 20 years before I ever had a radio ministry, but we got it done, hallelujah. And I would work for guys that had their own radio ministries, and I would work for them, just show up and volunteer so that I can learn this and learn that and, you know, figure things out and just to be in that atmosphere, which is what you do, right? That's what you do. And this old man had this uh, on, on 91.3 FM, which I'm on now uh, twice a day, which is cool. But he was an old, old guy. And um, when he was in his late 50s, um, his wife got pregnant. And they had a baby. And then it was like, well, okay. <laughs> and, but that, and he already had kids that was way out of the house, had been out of the house for a long, long, long time, right? Been out of the house for a long time. And now they got this surprise baby that's showing up, right? They're like, well, okay. Um, okay. And that child became the child of his old age. And oh my God, he loved that kid. I'm talking about I loved that kid. And when this kid was now 16, 17 years old, uh, he loved to do motorcycle racing, and he did dirt bike motorcycle racing, and he did all that kind of stuff. And now this old man, you know, who is like approaching 90 years old, <laughs> you know, he's running around going to all these BMX dirt bike things and doing this thing. And he would just tell every time we saw him, I say, man, how are you? Oh, hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus, Troy. Man, I saw the Lord at the dirt track this weekend. And he was a real calm dude. He was real calm. And, now, you know, I was in my 20s and I was out of my tree. This is the calm version of me now. Okay? And this is the, you know, uh, uh, you know the, 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 the cultured, refined version of Troy Brewer. And I was out of my tree. So I, I loved him and he just every weekend. And then... One weekend, his 16-year-old boy was in a terrible motorcycle crash and broke his neck, and he died. And that old man, I'm going to start crying right now thinking about it. That old man was so devastated. And I loved him so much. If I said his name, a lot of you guys would know him, and I don't want to do anything to dishonor him because, because I promise you this is going to have a good ending, okay? And... Leanna and I were brand new married, and I would go over to his house and knock on his door, and he wouldn't come outside, and he wouldn't see anybody. His wife had died. That's another thing, too. His wife had died. Maybe that little boy was like five or six years old whenever his wife died. And um, so he had raised this kid. Him and his other kids helped him raise this kid. And uh, they just loved him, and he was so full of life and loved Jesus so much and was just an extraordinary human being. And that old man was amazing. Well, that old man, it, it, it broke that old man. He went through a grief that, that I don't know that anybody on the planet can understand. And he, he grieved and, and grieved and grieved and grieved and wouldn't come out of his house and quit his ministry and quit everything and just decided he was just going to die. He was ready to go home. And um, his kids came and told me about this. And his kids were like my age. And his kids said, would you go knock on the door? Would you go talk to him? I went over there and knocked on the door and knocked on the door. And I knew that he could hear me. And uh, I just blessed him through the door of his house and prayed for him. Me and Leanna sat outside on his porch for a long time, praying for him and talking to him. And then one day I get, I was up at the uh, studio and uh, we're up there, and I'm in the studio, and I was working with Sharon Bolin and working with some other people that had some different radio shows. And I was up there, and I remember it was a Sunday afternoon, and I looked, and I thought I heard his voice, and I looked through this glass and this ne next glass and this next glass, and he was in his old office, and he was getting all of his stuff, and he looked like a million dollars. And I jumped up and went in there and said, what the heck? Hey! He's like, Troy, Troy, Troy. 
And he hugged me and loved me and said, thank you for coming to my house. I'm sorry I didn't respond. I didn't know how to respond. I was in a bad place. I was in a bad place. I'm like, well, what happened? He goes, oh, everything's different. I'm like, how could everything be different? He said, because he said that he was complaining to the Lord. And the story that I'm about to tell you, you can believe or you cannot believe. I can just tell you the difference between before this and after this. And this is what he said. He said that he was in a room and he was praying. He said, Lord, you knew that this would kill me and this is going to kill me. I love you with all my heart. I'm coming home to see you, but I'm done. You knew that this would kill me. You knew this. So let's just get it on. Let's get it on like Donkey Kong. I'm done. It's over. Let's go right now. Today's a good day for, um, for me to go home. I'm not eating. I'm not drinking. I'm not doing anything else. I'm, I'm coming home. And you knew. This is not on me, God. This is on you. You knew this was going to kill me. You know me. And he said, and all of a sudden, he said, the glory of the Lord filled the room. And he totally felt the weight and the presence of the Lord. And when he opened up his eyes, he saw across the room his son in a glorified body. And this is what his son told him. Daddy, Jesus Christ showed me you praying this prayer. And he said, this is going to kill your dad and he's going to blame it on me. So I'm just going to resurrect your body. I'm going to fix your broke neck. And I'm going to do all that. And he said, no, sir, I am never leaving your presence. My dad will be okay. There's no way I'm going to leave your presence. He said, Daddy, you taught me to choose Jesus. And Jesus gave me a choice in heaven, and I chose Jesus. Yeah. Repent and quit blaming this on the Lord. This is on you. This is not God's fault. This is your fault for telling me to choose Jesus. That's what that old man told me. And you know why he was packing up? Because he sold his house. He kissed his kids goodbye. He kissed his grandkids goodbye. And he went to the mountain of Mexico, to live, the mountains of Mexico to live out the rest of his life as a missionary. We, ne we never saw him again. He's like, bye. I'm going to go reach anybody I can. He could, he could speak Spanish. And he's like, I'm spending the rest of my life telling people this story and telling people how good Jesus is. And we never saw him again. You know, the same thing that makes you vulnerable to having an event that changes your life and alters it for the worse also makes you a candidate for having an encounter with God and altering your life for the better. And it's just so real. There are certain times in the Bible, guys, where God, where things just change and you can't help the change. I mean, everything just changes. It just, there are days where you're just like, whoa, okay, this is how it's always been, and now this is how it is. But you got to walk with Jesus in the new thing. In the, in, in the book of Joshua, there is this incredible, dramatic verse that just has this one phrase in it that I've thought about and thought about and thought about and thought about throughout the years. And, and it goes all the way back to whenever, whenever Moses brought the children of Israel out of, of, of Egyptian slavery and they came across the Red Sea. And guys, I want to tell you, if you do a study of where they crossed that, it's a thousand feet deep there. Like what? I mean, yeah, it wasn't, I, I know some people are like, well, at that part of the Red Sea, it was only ankle deep. Yeah, it's amazing how, you know, God drowned all those chariots in ankle deep water. Hallelujah. So anyway, what I was saying before, I was so rudely interrupted by terrible thoughts, is when they got to the other side, man, this manna showed up because they, God just said, okay, there's no way you can take care of yourselves in this place. So every single day when you wake up, there's going to be something on the ground, and you're going to look at it and look at it. You're, you're not, you've not ever seen anything like it. You're never going to be able to explain it. You're never going to see anything else like it. And it'll be on the ground, and you could just kind of scoop it up, and you can make whatever you want to out of it. You can make, you know, chicken fried manna. That's what I'd be making. <laughs> manna burgers, right? All that kind of stuff, right? Manna and cheese, all that. So, like, you can get it all together and you can do whatever you want to with it, but you're going to have, you're miraculously going to be fed every single day. And then there's this verse in John chapter 5, verse 12, as soon as they crossed over the Jordan River, they woke up the next morning and it says, and the manna ceased. Now, you know, Joshua chapter 1, he says, have courage, have courage, have courage. And one of the things that, you know, he's like, okay, 
Have courage, have courage, have courage, for I am with you, I am with you, I am with you. Okay, dudes, you're going to have these enemies, you're going to have walled cities, you're going to have giants, and you're going to have 31 flavors of kings. There was 31 kings, just like Baskin Robbins. And they all need a licking, every one of them. And so you got 31 flavors of kings over there, and you're going to have to get them. And I I don't want you just to attack them. I want you to attack them. I want you to drag them out, and I want you to put your foot on the back of their neck. Like, okay. A little bit dramatic, but okay. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I I ain't playing. This is a dangerous place, and you're going to have to get tough. Okay. In the midst of all that, they're like, okay, I'll have courage. I'll have courage. I'll have courage. But imagine how hard it was. When all of a sudden, there's no manna. They go, wait, 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 I didn't sign up for this. I signed up for that and that and that, but you didn't tell me. Now, I, what? How in the world are we supposed to eat now? What are we supposed to eat? We're a bunch of hillbillies. We have never farmed anything in our life. We know nothing about agriculture. We have been living in the wilderness for 40 years. We, we've never even been in a city. We've never seen a single city in 40 years until Jericho. We don't know how to live here, and now you ain't going to feed us? What's happening? Have you ever been in a place like that? Because I have. I go, Lord, I signed up for this and signed up for that. I didn't sign up for this. What the heck? And the manna ceased. The thing that has always worked no longer worked. The thing that you could always count on, you couldn't count on. The thing that made so much sense doesn't make sense. It's over. And I'm like, well, do you even want me to win in this place? Do you, do you want me to fail? Are you still with me? And God says, uh, 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 do you need to go back to the wilderness? Because see, that's the lesson of the wilderness. You told me you learned the lesson of the wilderness that you're always going to be with me and I'm always going to be with you. Do we need to go back and relearn that? No. Okay. Then let's go into this hard place because I'm going to give you a giant crown. That's what I'm going to do. Let's go. Like, okay. And when you get there, build it, occupy, and map it out for the people behind you so that they don't have to fight this same battle. Mm. There's another big change that happens in Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, there's a huge change. Up until Acts chapter 10, the move of God that had taken place had always been Jewish. Always. It had always been Jewish. Now, yeah, there'd be somebody here or there, you know, that, that was a Gentile that was just involved because of their faith. But something really weird happened in Acts chapter 10, and that's, you know, where, where Peter gets the whole, you know, vision, and he has all that, and he's in a place called Caesarea. And if you ever get a chance to go with me to Israel, we'll go to this very spot. And then he gets up, and the Lord sends this Roman to him, and he says, you got to come meet my friends. And he goes to all of these Gentiles, and he gets ready to preach the gospel which the gospel of Jesus was, this is the Old Testament promise, and this is how it was fulfilled in the person of Jesus. These people don't know anything about the Old Testament. They don't know anything. And Peter gets up, and as he begins to preach, the Bible says, and the Holy Spirit fell upon all of them. And it blew Peter's mind because them folk were Gentiles. There were Texans among that bunch. There were folk from South Dallas in that bunch. There were people from the border in that bunch. There were American Indians in that bunch. This was not the exclusive thing of the Hebrews anymore. And Peter went, okay, I got good news and bad news once he got back to Jerusalem. They're like, What's the good news? Man, God is moving and it's awesome. What's the bad news? Well, it's among the Gentiles. (laughs) Now, God didn't stop moving among the Jews. These were all Jewish guys that are now teaching Gentiles. But that was a game changer, man. At Acts chapter 10, everything changes. It's like, whoa, God wasn't kidding. He really wants to reach the whole world. And he's going to include the entire planet. Okay, then everybody in Jerusalem that's always thought they had it figured out, now they got to rethink 
everything. They're like, God, man, Jerusalem is getting destroyed. Folk are losing their mind. And now this. What is this? See, in that place right there, you have to have situational awareness. And you can't fall upon your traditions. You cannot fall upon the way things have always been. You have to hear God speak, and you have to conform your life to the image of Jesus Christ in that moment. That's what you have to do. There are aha moments that take place. In Luke chapter 15, the Bible says that the prodigal son, the kid that had run off, he had just an aha moment. He had, you know, what might be called a moment of clarity. He had a moment where suddenly he came to a reasonable mind, and he said, dang, he says, it says, when he came to his census, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starting to death. He's like, man, this is ridiculous that I'm doing this. And he had this aha moment. I'll just go back and I'll just be a servant in my father's house. That makes sense. Now, of course, God had a better plan for him than that, right? But he had this moment of clarity. He had this this time, and it's a Jeremiah 33, 3 moment that you and I can call out and ask God, show me something that I'm not getting. What is it that I'm not getting? God, I, I know, Lord, I'm, I'm bound to be missing something. He's like, yeah, just a couple of things. Please, God, for the sake of of what you've done in my life and for the sake of the promises that you have for me in this place right here, I don't know. I can't find one good thing about this place. What is this? He's like, oh, Troy, there's so many good things. Like, well, I don't know him. He's like, well, call out to me and I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. That's a 333 scripture, by the way. You got any 333 people in here that you see 333 all the time? Yeah. Like, you start seeing 333 everywhere, just stop what you're doing and cry out, Jesus! <laughs> like, well, I don't think that's necessary. Okay, well, the day ain't done yet. <laughs> don't wait until all hell breaks loose for you to get with the program, right? Don't do that. Don't do that. Just call out to him and say, okay, God, what am I missing? I am missing it. I'm missing it. Jeremiah 33.3. Last thing I want to show you, and I just have a minute left is in 2 Kings chapter 6, and I don't have time to go through all this scripture, but there is this amazing story where Elijah asks the Lord to open up the eyes of his servant. And he does. And what he, all he saw before was the lens of the threat that was against him. And then he said, dude, there's more for us than there are against us. And he's like, where? And he said, Lord, open his eyes. And then boom, and he saw all these fiery chariots. He literally saw chariots of fire. And he's like, oh, I see. There's literally something that has to take place in the midst of all the onslaughts that come against us where we are so aware of the enemy, what they're saying, what they're doing, how it's a lie, how it's wrong, what the threat is, how people are teaming up with it, that people that should have stood with you did not stand with you, people that ought to be speaking for you are not speaking for you. And you get so aware of all this and they're casting, you have to have a supernatural aha moment. We say, Lord, open my eyes so I can see. Because I, I'm sorry, Lord, but I've just been so scared. And, and, and if you've never been in a place where you're actually scared, come hang out with me. I'm in over my head all the time. <laughs> I don't have a clue, man. And, and I get up, and it might, if, if any of y'all think that I think I have my act together, you do not know me. And I'm just confident in the Lord, and I'm jumping into all kinds of stuff that I don't know what in the wide, wide world of sports we're going to do, or how we're going to do this, or how do you answer that, or whatever. And sometimes, man, honestly, I can't even sleep at night. I'm I'm just so wound up, and I'm so stressed out over, okay, i got to find the right way to think about this. I have to have a language for this when I meet with the teams tomorrow. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. And the Lord's like, "Mm, actually, all you got to do is rest in me. I'm like, okay, Jesus, is it cheating if I take Advil PM? And I, because it's three o'clock in the morning, and I got to get up super early and chase my dogs in a ghillie suit. You guys watch the TV. I know it sounds weird, but just trust me, it's cool. 
The last words of William Tyndale as they were about to choke him to death was, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. And they did. It wasn't very long after Tyndale was put to death for daring to preach the word of God in anything other than Latin and to actually have it printed in English was just a few years after that, the same exact king, King Henry VIII, said, you know what, we actually need an English Bible. Just occurred to him one day. Now, mind you, he'd been burning people to stake for that atrocity. And then he said, ah, I think it'd be a good idea to have an English Bible. And so guess whose Bible they used? It's Tyndale's. First version of it was something called the Coverdale Bible, but it was like 70 to 80% all Tyndale stuff. And what happened was that man had his eyes open. Jesus says in the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 18, he's talking to the church and he says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. It's like, my advice to you is pay the price. Hear what he says. You thinking about bowing your knee to this generation today? Thinking about not letting anybody know that you're a Jesus freak? Thinking about jumping through their hoops? Thinking about selling your soul, prostituting yourself because of the media? Here's what Jesus would say to you. My advice to you is pay the price. And then he says that you might be rich and have white garments and that you might be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness might not be revealed. And then he said this, and open and, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you might be able to see. We love you, Jesus. And Father God, sir, we pray, God, for supernatural situational awareness, God, that we would be able to see, that we would know what to know and how to know during this time. God, that we would see that there's much more for us than there is against us. Father, I pray in the mighty name of King Jesus, God, that our eyes would have the lens of heaven and not the lens that's being offered to us today. King Jesus, we receive your counsel. We receive your counsel, Lord God. I pray, Father God, sir, that we would have supernatural, situational awareness for every single field that we walk in, if it's family, if it's friends, whatever it is that's coming against us or coming against our friends, that we would know first and foremost how to be relational with those people, how to love people, how to bless people, how to encourage people in the midst of their trials and temptations and messes. But I pray, Lord God Almighty, sir, that we would have an eye to see how to invade heaven into this earth. Father, forgive us. Forgive us, God, for trying to fight in the field the same way that we do on the mountain. Forgive us, Lord Jesus, for not studying, for not learning new tactics, for not being a part of that, for just help us. Forgive us of that. And King Jesus, according to your word in Jeremiah 33, we cry out to you and we say, Lord, please show us. Please show us, God, great and mighty things that we do not know. And I love you. And I praise you and I thank you, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, let's give Jesus a great big praise. Isn't he good? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to ask everybody to stand up if you would, please. All of our altar team is coming forward.